One phrase that I've often fallen on, especially when covering games that aren't very good, is that no one purposefully sets out to make a bad game. I'm nice like that. I always approach something with the thought that, at least at the start of a project, there was surely the intention to make something good. Perhaps it's a little idealistic, maybe a little naive, but it's an idea that's there. However, there is this one game that has long flown in the face of my theory, and that game is Highlander. If you know this game, a licensed effort released by Ocean for the Micros in 1986, then you already know how terrible it is. But there is also a long-spoken rumour that it was actually engineered to be terrible from the beginning. The legend has it that Ocean were worried that the deal they'd signed to publish Highlander would cripple them financially in terms of percentages and cuts to the movie company if the game had been a success, and so they purposefully made it bad in order for the sales to tank. I've long heard this rumour. Indeed, I'm sure I've passed it around myself. But, well, is it actually true? I had to have a proper look, and I've come to the conclusion that it's not. However, there are some kernels of truth behind it that, through Chinese whispers, have probably formed into this tale. In actuality, the story of this woeful game, and in particular, the studio that created it for Ocean, is far more interesting than a story where a big publishing house purposefully scuppers a game in order to avoid paying a load of cash to a movie studio. I'll go into more detail as to why I don't think the story's true as we go, but we also have a studio story here. A story about perhaps one of the lesser lights of the microcomputer era, Canvas Software. A company born out of a much bigger and better company, featuring people who both deserved better, and other people who could have been so much more. I warn you now that it's not a very happy story. But before that, we have a game, and indeed, a licensed property, that will set the scene. Highlander itself isn't something I know a lot about, it's a film I haven't watched in years. I mostly just remember silly accents and long sword fights with beheadings. Still, it seems to attract strong opinions, I asked my girlfriend about it. Let's look in on what she has to say. The direction by Russell McKay absolutely shit, Christopher Lambert's acting absolute shit, I hate to say it was Sean Connery playing a spat, fuck off, and then there's Clancy Brown. Now, Clancy Brown is just chewing the scenery, okay, and it's terrible, right? There's actors who do it really now well. Now that was some time ago, and I believe Brown she's still going, <laughs> a true immortal. I'll just hold my hands up and say I'm none the wiser about the film itself, and look at its success instead. Although, actually, the film was a cinematic flop. It didn't make its budget back, only becoming a success later when released on home video and attaining cult status. Still in the midst of all of this, we have Ocean, known of course for their licensed games. They hadn't hit the Robocop pay dirt yet, that was a couple of years away, but they were still very keen on grabbing lots of movie, TV and arcade game licenses. Gary Bracey, Ocean's mercurial and brilliant development director, would be at the head of this, and he was pretty shrewd about it. He'd go straight out to Hollywood and grab projects when they were in the script stage, or early production. This is one reason to disbelieve the legend. Lots of studios didn't know much about the potential for film licences back then, and so Gary was usually able to get them for fairly cheap. That was famously the case with Robocop. I don't see how Highlander would have been different, it was made by the Cannon Group. Ocean would actually make another game for one of their films too, Cobra, and Gremlin also made a couple for Death Wish 3 and Megaflop Masters of the Universe. If they'd already had one deal with Cannon so bad that they had to purposefully tank the game, why would they then go back to work with Cannon again? Why would anyone else work with them? As one, famously by Israeli duo Golan Globus, Cannon by and large were B-movie people, making cheap 80s action often starring Chuck Norris or a near dead Charles Bronson, with the odd hit thrown in, usually more in the home video market. It's not like they had a massive weight to throw around. The Highlander game also coincided more with the cinematic release of the film, not the home release. In fact, it was released a couple of months after the UK release, well after it had already flopped in the US. So would there really be anything to indicate back then that Highlander was going to perform well anyway? Like, even if the game had been good? 
It's doubtful that it would have done. This is all theorising, of course, a lot of chin stroking over something that's purely received knowledge. I have stronger evidence which I can simply flow into the later story, but for now it's probably a good idea to just look at the game, cause <laughs> hoo boy. It isn't just bad, it isn't even just terrible, it's a contender for being one of the worst licensed games ever, right down there with Supergran and Dick Tracy. Those who think that LJN made the worst licensed games? <laughs> Frankly, they don't even know they were born. The worst games of the micros make them look like doom in comparison. There are three versions of this game, one for the Spectrum, which we're looking at first, and then others for the Commodore 64 and Amstrad CPC. One of the best things I can say is that there are only these three versions. Mercifully, there's no Amiga or ST or BBC Micro or frickin' Tate and Einstein version to pour over and be pissed at. Anyway, I suppose that it can be classed as a fighting game, in the loosest possible sense. You play as Conor McLeod, obviously, and there are three opponents to fight. First you have the legendary Egyptian immortal Ramirez, with big hat and everything. In the film he trains you, but here he just wants to lop your head off. Most people will not see any other character. One session of fighting against Ramirez will be enough, as this is the least responsive fighting game ever made. McLeod just seems to move on his own. You apparently do moves in the typical micro-fighting style, hold a direction and press the fire button. But 75% of the time these moves won't even come out. So there's no real point in doing anything except wildly hammering keys. In all likelihood you will not win the fight. And then, well, this just repeats. You and Ramirez face each other for as long as you can stand it while the game keeps score. It should be noted here that the game can be played in two player, although why anyone else would want to play this game with you is frankly beyond me. It would likely result in the bitter end of a friendship. Shockingly I can say that I have won a fight in Highlander. Somehow I managed to beat Ramirez with a ragtag mishmash of overheads and slashes. Once. Not that it actually changed anything, I just got a 1 next to my name instead of a 0, and the struggle continued. Not between Immortals, but between player and control. So how do you progress? Well, there is no progression. Highlander is basically the same game copied three times over on the tape. Wanna fight the other two guys? Just load them up. It's the same fight, but with a different sprite and background. You can fight against the French Immortal Facile, he of the sunglasses, except he's not Facile, because the game calls him Fazir. You think that's bad? The third fight is, of course, a battle against the Kurgan, who is somehow even more impossible than the other two, but get this, the game names him Kurg Han. This license is so bloody awful that they couldn't even get the name of the fucking main antagonist right. I mean, where do you go from there? Meatloaf once said that two out of three ain't bad, but what he didn't say is that one out of three is utterly bloody shite. I mean, is there anything good to say at all? There's an average background, big sprites, the animation isn't awful, but it's also impossible to work with. And there's basically no sound. Holy hell. This game is a catastrophe. I'd say it's worse than Highlander 2, except I've not actually seen the film's infamous sequel. Nor do I care to. So, what about those other two versions then? Honestly, they're the exact same game, only they have colour. Still the same animation, still the same horrendous level of play, all the games were programmed by the same people after all. There is one other highlight if you play the C64 version, you do get a fine SID rendition of Queen's A Kind of Magic, which was provided after the fact, as in after Ocean had received the finished game, by the almighty Martin Galway. You get one on the Amstrad version too, although it's not quite as good. I guess the Amstrad version wins out though, if only because of this sound effect that plays whenever someone gets decapitated. That's kinda cool. I can't imagine it was anything to do with the guys who actually made the game, mind you. In short, Highlander is by a long distance the worst game that Ocean ever put their name to, and one of the worst of the entire microcomputer era. It quite obviously reviewed terribly and sank like a stone. So you know, if it is true that Ocean had to tank the game in order for it to sell badly and not have to pay a cack ton of money to Canon, then well, mission fucking accomplished I suppose.
However, I would again say that this legend, funny though it may be, isn't true. Because now we have to look into the true story of this game, and why it was such a total stinker. Another reason to doubt it. This wasn't actually made by Ocean in-house. You may think that the Central Street Programmer's Dungeon, complete with its Quaker roots and it being literally built on top of a burial ground, would be an appropriate place for the game's development. But no, it was actually sent out of house by Ocean to a team called Canvas, who operated out of the suburb of Crosby on the outskirts of Liverpool. And so we get to tell the Canvas story, which goes a couple of years back, to another Liverpool game company who were much more famous, more important, and burned out very fast indeed. Yep, it's time to roll that commercial breaks documentary footage again. So here we are again, with Imagine. The super team of coders and artists, the fast cars, the racing team, and of course the spectacular demise going down in a blaze of ritz with barely anything done to their purported super game Bandersnatch, much to the surprise and horror of their creditors. We know that a chunk of Imagine, specifically Ian Heverington, Eugene Evans and briefly Dave Lawson, went off to form what would eventually become Psygnosis. But another big chunk went on to something else, a smaller dev studio by the name of Denton Designs, largely built from those who'd worked on Bandersnatch. Coders John Gibson and Ian Weatherburn, artists Ali Noble, Steve Kane and Karen Davis, and designer Graham Everett, usually nicknamed Kenny Everett after the famous DJ and TV personality. Denton would quickly become a celebrated name. This very talented group, working with Ocean and beyond software, made games like Gift from the Gods, Shadowfire, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, and perhaps best remembered of all, The Great Escape in a rapid fire 12 month period that saw them very quickly become the talk of the specky town. And yet, they didn't last long in this form. It took a little over a year for them to break up, for various reasons, eventually leaving Ali Noble as the sole original member of the group remaining, although this second wave of Denton would survive and thrive under a new group of talented game makers. What happened? Well, Denton was thought of almost as a collective by its founders, not wanting to repeat the mistakes that had scuppered their previous home. And yet, quickly, they ran into issues there, as good as their games were, there was a hard limit to their success as they had no knowledge of marketing and no ability to get out from under companies like Ocean and beyond. It seems like this was one of the main reasons behind the split. And so a bunch of things happened. Karen and Kenny moved more into freelance work. John Gibson settled for a solid position inside the Ocean Dungeon and later Psygnosis. Steve Kane, however, joined up with Ian Weatherburn, who'd left Denton acrimoniously a few months previously, to form Canvas with another programmer named Roy Gibson. Ian had been the first to bristle at the collective nature of Denton, making decisions based on group consensus wasn't really for him. A dispute was inevitable, it occurred over Shadowfire, and ultimately Denton voted 1-5 to five in favour of Ian's removal. I think you can guess who the one was. Of the six, Ian was the one who perhaps missed the imagined days the most, the success, the fortune, the name in lights, and he was indeed a star there. Alchemist, one of the most successful games released under the original Imagine, was his. With Canvas, Ian wanted a company that he could be much more at the head of. Now it should be noted that, well, not a lot of good has been said about Ian Weatherburn. Accounts and memories of Ian come largely from those who would work with and under him at Canvas, people such as graphics designers Simon Butler and Dawn Drake, or John Gibson at Imagine, and they paint a certain picture of him. He was quiet and very closed off, he had very few friends in the industry, nor did he seek them out. As a boss he was quite autocratic and focused purely on the task at hand, no time for small talk. Some mention less savoury parts, such as his humour being often at the expense of other people, or a somewhat acerbic nature. However, the man was also very clearly supremely talented. There was no question in his programming and design ability. In many ways, the success that he had in Imagine, and at such a young age, like many bedroom coders, he was barely out of school when he hit pay dirt had perhaps skewered his expectations, meaning that his desires were for lots of money and fast cars. And, as we will see with Canvas, those desires were ultimately more important than creating good titles. 
They are not a studio with a list of good games under their belt. Indeed, quite the opposite. Anyway, Canvas would quickly be affiliated with the Ocean Empire. It's certainly true that with the amount of licenses that Ocean were acquiring, no one affiliated with them would ever be short of work. And the same applied for Ocean's bitter rivals from Birmingham. Canvas would also work often with US Gold. There are a couple of highlights. The excellent Spectrum versions of the leaderboard games, headed up by Weatherburn, are undoubtedly the best thing that they did. Their first game, a text adventure take on the never-ending story, also came in for good notices, as did Ian Weatherburn's own Nomad. But in the main, well, there's a lot of lousy work. Not only Highlander, but also Miami Vice, It's a Knockout, Legend of Kage, Athena, Roadrunner, Charlie Chaplin, all of these have the canvas name on them, and they're all quite terrible indeed. This despite the talent clearly present at the studio. So what's the deal? For a lot of the inside take on canvas, we have Simon Butler to thank. He's still a very visible person in the UK retro gaming scene to this day, and has gone into his time at canvas often. Indeed, he's one of the people who worked on Highlander. He worked on graphics alongside Steve and Martin Calvert, while design was handled by Steve Kane and coding by Roy Gibson. Steve Kane was one of Simon's best friends in the industry, but even then, Simon Butler is less than complimentary about his skills in game design. Graphics and pixel art were much, much more his thing. Highlander, originally, was going to be more of a platform game. It would have perhaps been better in this form than what eventually arrived. But the original concept proved too ambitious, and we were eventually left with the broken fighting game we see today. The design and coding talent just wasn't there, and all the graphics team could do in the very short time allowed for development was make a couple of backgrounds and transfer Steve Kane's sprites from graph paper to the computer screen. There was another factor in all of this, of course. The short time. Generally speaking, a lot of these licensed games and arcade conversions were knocked out in mere weeks, especially in the case of Canvas, because they took a lot of them on. With Weatherburn and Roy Gibson at the helm, they basically became mercenaries in pursuit of the dollar, and it appears that any form of quality control just went out of the window. And this was, in fact, quite purposeful. The attitude from Ian and Roy appeared to be that Ocean wouldn't notice how bad these games were simply because of how many they were releasing at the time, so they'd go out under the radar and Canvas would continue to pump out these very quickfire projects. Steve Kane was unhappy with this approach and would leave the company quickly as a result, deciding to go into more of a freelance role with Ocean, Firebird and others. The attitude, and the negative atmosphere it created, was also too much for Simon Butler. He'd leave and find himself in the Ocean Dungeon where his talents were put to much greater use. Dawn Drake, another talent, would follow suit. And also, well, Ian and Roy's estimation of Ocean's lack of quality control was utterly incorrect. They certainly did notice the poor quality of Canvas's games. Hell, a lot of them didn't even ship with any sound. Ocean would try to polish up Canvas as turds as best as they could, usually in two ways. First get an excellent musician like Martin Galway in to, you know, actually add some decent music and sound into the project. The second was for another of the great talents they had at their disposal, Bob Wakelin, who was responsible for designing a lot of Ocean's legendary game covers. Interviewed about his work while he was still alive, Wakelin specifically mentioned Highlander as a game where Ocean had basically said to him, look, We've got a real dog of a game here, so we need you to make some cracking art for the cover so we can actually have any hope of selling it. It's no coincidence that some of Bob Wakelin's absolute best cover art was done for some of Ocean's very worst games. Martin Galway has also said much the same thing about his music and sound for Highlander. Ocean came to him saying that they really needed some good work just so that, you know, there was something there. Going back to the legend of Highlander being purposefully bad, I think that this is where it comes from. The truth of the matter is that the management at Canvas didn't care about the quality of their titles and would send low quality, even unfinished work to companies like Ocean, who would then have to try and sell it as best they could. That's the main reason for the sheer badness of games like Highlander. Because Ocean noticed how bad Canvas's games were, the licenses that they would send to Canvas, well, they certainly wouldn't be anything major.
Soon enough, they'd be stuck with the likes of Athena and The Legend of Kage, conversions of arcade games that were obscure enough to begin with, and were hardly tipped for any kind of success. Unfortunately, Canvas never really noticed this trend of Ocean sending them increasingly lesser licenses to work on. As the decade neared its end and Ocean got ever bigger, well, they'd stop sending Canvas any work at all. They disappeared off their file effects, wondering what went wrong. This would be pretty much the end for the company. Soon enough, the relationship between Ian Weatherburn and Roy Gibson would go sour too. According to some, Roy took advantage and may have taken the lion's share of the money and gone off to a new job in America, leaving Ian in the lurch, at the head of a failing company with little work coming in, debts piling up and creditors starting to sniff around. Canvas would soon go bust, likely at some point before the decade was out. Now the end of this story, alas, is pretty grim. With Canvas at a virtual end, along with both business and personal debts mounting up, Ian Weatherburn made the decision, in March of 1989, to take his own life. He was just 23 years old. His story is one that's desperately sad, and represents a certain dark side to the fallout of the early British microcomputer boom as represented by companies like Imagine. When Ian was all of 16, he became massively successful, earning more in a couple of years than a lot of people earn in 20, or more. But those good times didn't last, and Ian had become accustomed to them, chasing those times again with unfortunately diminishing returns. Some have speculated that his personality, his lack of people skills, and utter focus on programming and later money above all else, including social interaction, are indicative of a mental health issue, Asperger's perhaps, that at the time would have been undiagnosed. But it should never be forgotten that Ian Weatherburn was one of the most talented coders in the early 80s boom period, and his best work absolutely speaks to that. In a different time, at an older age, or, or with a different, less spectacular start, he could well have gone on to the sort of career that those talents deserved. Simon Butler's own tribute to Ian, written much later, pulls no punches but ends with a fitting and poignant line. He could have been happy, but sadly he never was. Other people from Canvas would go on to lawn industry careers, people such as Simon Butler, still part of the industry today, and Steve Kane, who stayed in the industry through his work in life before sadly passing of lung cancer in 2006. Others still also met sadly tragic ends, such as Steve Calvert, shockingly murdered in 2007. This may have not been a story filled with highlights, perhaps. It's certainly not a story with a happy ending. But the story of Canvas is perhaps a cautionary one. The 80s microcomputer world certainly wasn't all glitz, glamour, celebrated figures and successful companies. A lot of others would never make it and fall by the wayside, some with ugly consequences indeed. It can happen, particularly in industries built on people who are of a remarkably young age who weren't mature enough to handle such immediate success. And that's certainly not limited to the games industry of the early 80s. It's in TV, film, sports. Hell, it's right here on YouTube. It's funny really, I initially expected the video for this one awful licensed game and the amusing legend surrounding it to be quite a light one, and in the end I think I've managed to put out probably my most depressing video to date. But well, it was a legend worth examining, and in the end, a story that's important to tell. Bye for now. Thanks for watching this video on the awful Highlander game and the tragedy of Canvas Software. If you liked the video, please do like it, comment, subscribe, and look at all my social media, including my Patreon, where you can support more videos like this. Speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank the following. Alexander Jazeri, Andrew Dalton, Andy Capt, Asobi Kwan DX, Chris, Conrad Pritchard, Daniel Briggs, Daniel Dave Taylor, Dave Cork, David Rose, Dustin Cooper, Gary Pinkett, Gary Samaden, Jordi Alex, James Loveridge, Jason Stevens, Jace Alexander, Lee Norris, Loms Daniel, Lucas Kaligowski, Martin Pataki, Nicholas Tristan, Nikki and Bunty, Peter Jack, Filter Prog, 
Cotta Margell, Pixels Limited, Renby One, Are You OK 2000, Seth Robinson, Simon Gulliver, Yucca Operator, and Zach Roach. And to all the rest of the patrons, thank you and goodbye.